So when I was growing up, my grandfather had a car wash in Nassau County as my mom's dad. And um, we used to, I used to love going there with my family to uh, the car wash. And it was this whole rundown thing, I guess, out in Nassau County. And I used to, I used to park myself in front of the window and, and just watch the cars go by one after another and just all the different things that are going on in a car wash. I was probably like, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years old or something like that. And, and, and then the thought obviously came, came into my mind, right? Like, I wonder, yeah, you know what I'm going. I wonder what it would be like if I ran through the car wash. Did anybody ever think about running through a car wash? Has anybody ever run through a car wash? I'm here today because I didn't run through the car wash, thankfully. I don't know if I would have come out the other side. And if I did, I think my grandfather would probably would have, would have killed me. Um, but wouldn't that be a ride? I mean, could you imagine what it must have been like or would have been like to kind of get on that conveyor belt, you know, kind of like out there in the open. And, and as you're going on, right, the water starts coming at you, right? The, the buffers start kind of bumping into you as you go. And the, the dryers are just kind of like slapping you across the face. And, and the rollers are just, because it kind of like comes out of nowhere, right? Like you're just kind of going. And when you first get at the entrance, it just looks like a tunnel. And then they click the button and all of a sudden everything starts coming from the ceiling and the sides and underneath and it kind of comes from every different direction the bumping and the maybe it's probably not a good idea for us to 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 run through the car wash but have you ever felt like you've been through the car wash in life <laughs> right where you're kind of like on this conveyor belt and things are dropping on you and slapping at you and bumping at you and spraying on you and you just don't know what's coming from what direction. It's just kind of like you're on this ride or this conveyor belt that you can't even control and it just kind of seems like things are coming at you from every possible direction. Perhaps you're feeling like that right now. I think, I think a lot of people are feeling like that right now in our culture. Um, there's a lot going on. It's hard to know where to put so many of the questions and so many of the emotions and so many of the feelings and so many of the, the narratives that are being introduced into our life. I never before recall a time in a season of life kind of like this, where we have no history to draw from to learn how to navigate through what is an incredibly quickly shifting culture. We are clearly in, 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 in challenging times. And the tendency can be just to, just to pull away, just, just to run in the opposite direction. I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people and, and I don't know if it's a jest or a dream or, or what, but, or a plan, I don't know. But uh, so many people have said, oh, wouldn't it be so nice to just to go buy some acreage way out in like Montana or some crazy place where we can kind of get away from everything and just kind of recreate our own community and do what we want to do and just to kind of get away from it all. I mean, there's something very appealing about that. And, but here's the thing. God's people are never called to run from a problem. We are called to lead through the problem. We are called to lead through the chaos. We are called to lead through the, through the, the transitions of, of life, whatever they may be. And God is always looking to see who will step up and be a voice? Who will step up and be an influence for God? Who will be an example to help shift culture towards Christ? Times are hard, but they've been harder. 
God always called upon his people to step up in times of difficulty. That was the call that God placed on the prophet of Jeremiah. We're gonna be heading over to 2 Kings. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. But Jeremiah was born in the midst of one of the darkest times in history. At that time, King Manasseh was the king. He reigned in Jerusalem for 55 years. He was perhaps the most vile, evil kings the Hebrews had ever had. And he presided over a very corrupt government. And he did so for 55 years. When a culture has a vile, wicked king overseeing 55 years of time, culture has a way of beginning to reflect the king. He created an environment where, where pagan worship was not only practiced, but celebrated and rewarded. Throughout the countryside, the, the temples where, where once worship of the one true God took place was now the location for community orgies temple prostitution and the worship of false gods. This King Manasseh would import wizards and sorcerers from around the world who would get people enslaved in their temple sorcery and magic. Eugene Peterson wrote a book many years back called Run With The Horses. I would highly recommend a reading of that book. But he points out that this man, Manasseh, could not do enough evil. There seemed to be no end to his barbarous cruelties. His capacity for inventing evil was bottomless and his desire for the sordid was insatiable. Second Kings chapter 21 gives us a glimpse into the wickedness of this king's character 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Think about that for a moment. I mean, you, you get a 12-year-old behind a throne, something bad's going to happen, right? He'll run through a car wash. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hezbabah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Think about that. Historically before that, God drove out the wickedness that existed within the nations, the, the wicked, vile practices that came into the land of God's people. God drove them out. And here, this king is bringing it all back in. He rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed, those high places of, of worship to false gods. He erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, it's an idol, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And so he directs the worship of, of God's people from the one true God to many many gods. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, in Jerusalem will I put my name. God said those, those, those temples were to be set aside as a holy place to worship the one true God. But he built altars in the house of the Lord. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in two courts of the house of the Lord. And look at this. And he burned his son as an offering. Could you imagine that? And he used fortune telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. And he did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking God to anger. Yeah, I'm sure it did. 55 years, 
this was going on in a culture that was set aside to be a people that worshiped the one true God. I mean, when a man like that is ruling for 55 years, it's certainly going to have quite an influence on society. Those who held to the worship of Yahweh, the one true God, they were, they were marginalized, they were discredited. They had no place in this decadent society. This was the world that Jeremiah was born into. Jeremiah was born in the last decade of Manasseh's rule. And so it was in that environment that Jeremiah learned how to walk and how to talk, how to run and play on their playgrounds. This was the community. This was the environment. He had 10 years of living under the kingship of Manasseh. Imagine how the culture and the things that he had seen. Imagine growing your, raising your child up in such a time, in such a place as that. It's the kind of thing that you just can't wait till the king's dead. You can't wait till he's gone so that his influence is, is gone. Well, eventually, thankfully, Manasseh finally dies. And his son, Ammon, takes over. And I'm sure the people hoped to see a major change. In fact, we know they did because of the way in which they responded. You see, the problem was Ammon comes into rulership and just like his father, with the same in, 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 in initiatives and values and decadence, he continues to promote the same vile ways of his father. But the people have had it. The people do not want that kind of a king and so they kill. Ammon, quickly. And it kind of reflects the fact that people want to change. And so what ended up happening was Ammon had a son as well, Josiah. Josiah was eight years old, and he became king. So you got a 12-year-old king, and you've got an eight-year-old king. Any eight-year-olds in a group? Probably not, right? They're all next door. Yeah, imagine, eight years old. And he's a king. But unlike his father, Ammon, and unlike, unlike his grandfather, Manasseh, Josiah has a tender heart. There was an innocence about him, a very uncorrupt spirit about him that was well received from the people. It inspired hope in the people of Israel. They, they, they got rid of Ammon because they wanted a, the, the right kind of ruler that would shift their culture back to what it needed to be. Listen to the characterization of Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse one. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida. That's a fun name to say. Say it with me, Jedida. Isn't that cool? Jedida. I would never raise my name somebody that way, but that worked for them. So his mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. There we go. And look, here's, here's, what we need, here's what we need to know about Josiah. The most important thing, you ready? Unlike his father and his grandfather who did evil in the sight of the Lord, verse two says, Josiah, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he walked in the way of David, his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or the left. I'd love to read that about Josiah. What a, a, a young man of, of integrity, right? He did right what was in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the way of David. And I love this. It says he, he did not turn to the right or to the left. He remained focused in the direction that God would have him to go. God, in the midst of the filth of that society, raises up a young man who is committed to shifting this culture back to God. One day, Josiah calls upon the priest and tells them to go into the house of the Lord and, and gather whatever money is there and pull all the money out and then go out and buy whatever we need to buy so that we can fix up and restore the temple. We can restore the house of the Lord. 
I love this because Josiah knew that if he was going to shift the culture back, he would need to repair the temple and provide a place for them to come and worship God. If they wanted to see the, 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 the community change, he knew it started with fixing up and restoring the temple. He prioritized the house of the Lord and something extraordinary happens. They go back to the house of the Lord. They, they begin to gather whatever resources they can that, that, that's there. And then over there in the corner under a whole bunch of rubble and dust and everything else, they find something very, very valuable. Second Kings chapter 22 and verse eight. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it and Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king and said, your servants emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have oversight of the house of the Lord. And then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book and Shaphiah read it before the king. Look, and when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. What an incredible find. There they are looking for resources to build the temple, but what God helps them to discover is the very foundation of what will make the, te the temple effective. It's the very word of God. And they bring the word of God back to the king and they read it and he tears his clothes, symbolic of repentance and remorse and covenant and changes on the horizon. He begins to put so structure behind his desire to see a shift in the culture. It's an amazing thing that happened. Josiah, despite the influence of his father and his grandfather, he begins to ask the question, how do we turn this society around? How do we restore the blessing of God in the land? of God's people. He has them restore the temple because the temple represents the place where the people of God gathered together in the presence of God. And you see, if you want to have a strong community, you've got to have a strong church. If they wanted to have a strong community, they had to have a strong temple. And if we want to have a strong impact, a strong influence, we've got to have a strong church. And while they're rebuilding the temple, they're worshiping God, and they come across, right, the word of God, and upon hearing the word of God, King Josiah has this moment where he tears his clothes, and he recognizes things need to change. And he goes about reforming the community in a way that only a king can because of his influence and because of his power and his ability to just do what he wants to do, he begins to reform. Look at first, uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, 23 and verse one. Then the king sent and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him and the king went up to the house of the Lord and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. What's going on here is the king's like, listen, it's time for a meeting. It's time for it to come to Jesus meeting. Get everybody in the room. Get everybody close. We need to, it's time for change. And so he reaches out and he ensures everybody he is here present. And what does he do? He says, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people joined in this covenant. What a beautiful picture we have of Josiah. He hears the word of the Lord. And I love this. Instead of focusing on we, he focuses on me. Look, it says he gathers the people and it says he reads the word of God to people and he makes a covenant 
with God. Not for them, but for himself. Hey folks, here's where I'm going. If you're interested, jump on with me. But instead of dealing with we, he deals with me. He makes a covenant with God. What's his covenant? To walk after the Lord. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. Josiah declares a covenant before God. I will walk after the Lord. Secondly, he says, and I will keep his commandments and his testimonies and statutes with all of my heart, with all of my soul. I mean, what Josiah is saying, I am all in. With everything in me, I'm crossing over the line. And I'm not only going to be a reader of the word, I'm going to be a doer of the word. He says, to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. Who wouldn't want to get behind a leader like that? Josiah sets the stage. And look, all the people joined in the covenant. And then Josiah goes on a tirade. <laughs> reforming the community, tearing down the altars, burning down all of the idols and statues that, were, statues that were made to the false gods. He booted out all the false priests and tore down the houses of prostitution. Everything that was dedicated to the false gods was, poured, was torn down. He removed and then executed all of the priests of the false gods. He cleaned house. And then look what he does. Verse 21. And the king commanded all the people, keep the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. For look, how horrible. For no such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel who are adoring all the days of the kings of Israel or the day of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. Think about that. For all those years, the Passover, that, that moment where the people of God would come and celebrate God's faithfulness that in the past and, and, and their focus for the future, they stopped celebrating the Passover. And he reinstitutes the Passover. We talked about the Passover a couple weeks ago when we worshiped outside. It was a tool of remembrance where the people would remember how God spared them when the death angel saw the blood on the doorpost, he would pass over their home and not bring judgment upon that, that house. It was a tool for them to look back at what God did, and it also was a tool to look forward as that was a type of the blood of Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb applied to the doorpost of our hearts that spares us from the death angel. And so Passover is that tool by which we look back at what God did and then in their case, they look forward to what Christ would do by shedding his blood. Well, Josiah died very young, 39 years old. Did a lot in a short amount of time. You see, there was a there was a change in the behavior of the people. If I say behavior. There was a change in the behavior of the people, but there is no mention of a change in the people's hearts. And that's a problem. You see, under Josiah, morality was on the rise. People were going to temple. They were being nice to one another. But much of the change that took place came from the heart of the king, not the heart of the people. History will demonstrate and, 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 and back up exactly what I'm saying as we see what Jeremiah has got to say about the people during this time of Josiah's rule. And you see, while all this was going on, while, while the people are going through the motions of behavior modification, 
They hadn't experienced transformation on the inside. And so their hearts were still far from God. And in the midst of all of this, Jeremiah is seeing it all. He's seeing the hypocrisy. He's seeing what's coming out of the mouth, but still residing within the heart. And at this point, I, 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 Jeremiah is about 40 years old. And he is watching all of this unfold before him. After Josiah died, they made his son Jehoahaz king. And unlike Josiah, who did right in the eyes of the Lord, his son did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And he remained in that position for three months. And at that point, Jehoiakim is now installed, and he reigns for 11 years. And he, too, does what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. He dies, and Jehoiachin becomes king at the age of 18. He remained three months, and he, like his recent predecessors, he too does what's evil in the sight of the Lord. The reason I point that out is we will oftentimes see that God will install a king in accordance with the hearts of the people. Simply put, God gave him a king in accordance with their heart. He gave them a king that they deserved. And the people, when the people wanted change from the ways of Manasseh, he gave them Josiah. But when they got comfortable with the teachings and the change that Josiah brought, they went back to the ways that they learned under Manasseh. And God said, okay, if that's the kind of king you want, that's the kind of king you'll have. You see, they didn't operate out of a heart of love, but instead they became familiar with the blessings of God. They took, they took for granted God's goodness and apathy came upon the people and apathy led right to hypocrisy which is what Jeremiah will talk about. It didn't take long for Jeremiah to begin calling the people out for the hypocrisy. Enter the book of Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, not because he's melancholy or depressed, but because he sees a people who are under the blessings of God, but moved in disobedience towards God and was fully aware that God's judgment was going to come upon the people and he would cry out, Turn from your ways. Don't toy with God. Don't think that just because you're not experiencing the consequences of your actions, the actions aren't going, the consequences aren't going to come. A surface reading of the book of Jeremiah will demonstrate to us the heart of God towards the apathy and the hypocrisy of his people. And so he is weeping as he declares a judgment is coming. Notice the opening of Jeremiah chapter one. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came. Look, when? In the days of Josiah. That's when his ministry started, the son of Amnon, Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah and king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah the son of Josiah, the son of the king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. All of which is about to be said in, Jeru in, in, in the book of Jeremiah, the judgment upon God's people is directed towards those people during that time period that we just read about in 2 Kings chapters 21, 22, and 23. How can a people move from darkness into blessing and then shift back into darkness again. Apathy. When apathy settles in, people go back to their old ways. 
Listen to what God says to them through Jeremiah in chapter seven in verse four. God says, do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. What, what, what is this about here? What was going on is the people, again, they were going through the motions. They were going into the temple, like, oh, the, the temple of the Lord. We're in the house of God with one another. Their outward appearance looked like they were present in God's house, but they were not in the presence of God, if you know what I mean. Who's he saying this to? The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. God says, don't trust these deceptive words. Who's he saying that to? To the people who began to rebuild, reform the temples under the instruction of Josiah. But then they began to use what they did, the construction of the temple, their good works, their, their good actions, their, their, their success stories from yesterday to validate their sinful actions of today. You see, what they started to do is they leaned so heavy on their past that they didn't focus on their present and certainly affected their future. And can I tell you, I find Christians like that all the time. They're so, they can't get past all the things that God did, all the ways God spoke to them, all the way God moved on their hearts. They have so many stories about the past, and I want to say, well, what's he saying to you now? What's going on in your heart now? How are you growing now? How are you passionate in love with Jesus now? I don't want to hear about yesterday. I celebrate that with you, but are you moving forward? And you see, what was happening in the people here is they were so caught up in yesterday that apathy set in, and apathy led to hypocrisy. They comforted themselves with the words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and God says, don't deceive yourself. Your heart is not aligned with your actions. And we will read about this call to repentance as we go through the different various passages of Jeremiah. As he calls the people to repent of their apathy, their hypocrisy, and to turn back to the Lord. Why is this so important today? Because I believe this is where many in the church are at today. As your pastor, I've got to tell you, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I'm concerned when I see people who were once so enthusiastically loving Jesus, so passionately pursuing the community of Christ, serving in the house of God. I'm concerned when they're absent. I'm concerned when I see the priorities of gathering together become a distant second to anything that comes across that's more appealing. I'm concerned that there's things that are more appealing than the house of God, than being in the presence of the Lord, than of worshiping God, than being in his word, and serving, and being the church. I don't know where we're at in the whole eschatological scheme of things. I think we're very close. Any moment the rapture can take place, I believe that with all my heart. But the scripture also talks about a great falling away. Many who you worshiped with are gone. Now, I don't know where we're at in all of that. I've got my suspicions, but so have others for centuries but I am seeing something of concern. And I'm ringing the bell 
and saying the church needs to wake up. It's not just Integrity Church. It's churches all across America. We are not the people of Israel. Integrity Church is not the temple. I am certainly not Jeremiah. But I do see a lull in the church. I do see those who served with passion and enthusiasm, distant and disconnected. And it grieves my heart not because I'm looking to build an organization, dear God, no, but because we are an organism. We are the church of Jesus Christ, a living, breathing entity that it needs one another. The scriptures warn us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the habit of some is, and even more as the day approaches. Now you're watching today and you're tuned in today and so hey you're off the right here you're probably really happy you showed up today <laughs> but I get concerned when the national average on church attendance is one and a quarter times per month across the United States one and a quarter times a month what would happen if you showed up at your job one and a quarter times per month? What would happen if you loved your wife or your, hu your husband or your children one and a quarter times per month? I appreciate it. My son said to me today, you know, the, 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 he, just, he said the, the, the problem in America the last hundred years is we have focused so much on our relationship with God that we've not talked enough about ecclesiology, the study of the church and the importance of the church and what God is doing. And I was like, that is so profound. He's going to preach that someday. He doesn't know it, but he is. But, <laughs> but that's, that's such a true statement. See, we were designed to need each other. We were created to learn from each other, to grow together, to accomplish great things that no one of us could possibly do. That's why the scripture calls us the body of Christ. But I see a lull. And it's not, it's not because anybody's just saying, I just want to be sinful and do what I want to do. I, that's, not, that's not what we're fighting against. I really believe that. I think people are tired. I'm scared. Confused. They're divided over the wrong things. Distracted by things that have no eternal value at all. And they just want to throw the towel in not on God. Nobody wants to throw the towel in on God. But on serving God. On living out our purpose in God. On being the people that God has called us to be. I see the church getting distracted with things, good things even, but that are keeping them from that passionate pursuit of Jesus that we're called to actively pursue. And you see, when that happens, apathy sets in, just like it did amongst God's people who were experiencing the good times under the time of Josiah. They celebrated the behavior modification, but they didn't pursue the transformation. They pursued the religion, but they did not pursue that relationship. I think it's always good to take a moment of pause to consider and examine ourselves. I know I'm going over. I don't normally preach this long, but I'm going to unapologetically share with you what's on my heart today because this has been heavy on my heart. I think it's important to ask ourselves some hard questions. Questions like, 
have I ever been closer to Jesus than I am right now? That's a simple question. I know, and I know for all of our theologians in the room, oh, positionally, we are perfect before God. Yeah, I get that. But have you ever been closer to Jesus? Was there a time where you sought to be with Jesus more than you are right now? Where he, where he was more important than everything else going on in the world around you? Are there, are, there things, are there things that are in your life that prevent you from pursuing Jesus? Are there obstacles along the way? Some of those things could even be good things. In Josiah's day, he tore down all of the idols that prevented people to get to the, the true God. Well, we don't have these at the moment, who knows what they're going to come up with, but we don't have the statues today, but we have all the kinds of things like money and jobs and relationships and, and dreams and goals and all these other things that fill our calendar and that we, we, we prioritize in our life. And every one of those things might be a good thing, but when a good thing keeps us from the best thing, it's an idol. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying remove your family, right? But I'm saying we need to put some proper boundaries around things so that nothing gets in the way of our pursuit of Jesus. Apathy has a way of slowly creeping into our lives. It doesn't just happen overnight. I think, I think it was Chris Casting Crowns, you know that song they sing, Slow Fade. It's just a slow fade. You don't, you don't, you don't get to where, I mean, I had a time in my life when I was younger where I just walked away from the Lord and it just was a really hard, hard time in my life. And, and, uh, but it didn't, happen, it didn't happen overnight. It was, a, it was a missed church service. It was a missed prayer meeting. It was a disconnecting from Christians. It was a no longer spending time in prayer. It was no more time in the word. It was no more prioritizing my time with Jesus. It was a slow fade of consistent decisions and then I realized, how'd I get here? It's gradual. See, here's the reality. You're, you're either walking closer to Jesus or drifting from Jesus. That's, that's it, folks. I mean, that, that's, if I could just put it as simple as possible, there is no middle ground. You're either walking closer to Jesus or you're walking away from Jesus, because Jesus is always, the Holy Spirit is always working on us. He's always conform. He's always growing us. Has apathy settled in? Let me give you five signs of apathy, and I, I've prayed so much about this. I prayed, God, I say, you know, I'm like, Lord, they're going to get up and look forward to coming to the house of God. Nobody wants to go to church and get beat up. It's like, Lord, can you allow this message to just land in their hearts of your people in a way that's encouraging? Because there's encouragement coming. But as your pastor, I'd be failing you if I didn't raise the alarm and say there's it's time, folks. It's time to get serious. Five signs of, of apathy. Number one, familiarity. A loss of the sense of awe. Familiarity with God. Right? Do you remember those moments? You remember the first time you walked into a church and you just thought, wow, it's amazing. Sense God's presence, or the times in prayer, or whatever. There's just a, a healthy fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. And now it's kind of like I'll spend time praying between the changing of a red and green light. Familiarity with God, familiarity with the people of God. Hey, you remember when you thought everybody was perfect? You remember when you thought everybody really loved Jesus and was completely sold out and then you came to realize that they were just as imperfect as you? But that sense of awe is gone. We become familiar with each other. When we become familiar from each, with each other, we can learn from each other. 
We can't sharpen each other. We can't grow from each other. We're not, there's nothing common about anybody who has embraced Jesus. Familiarity with God, the, the people of God, and the house of God. Something we can just take or leave. Familiarity. Second sign of apathy is boredom. Boredom. Not living for purposes bigger than yourself. Remaining in a place of being under-challenged. Do you know what happened to you? You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, he made alive together in Christ Jesus. You who are not a people are now the people of God. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You've got the spirit of God within you. There's no room for boredom. You're not here. You're not designed to pursue all the goals of this world. You'll never be satisfied. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. God has called us to a life of excitement, of trusting him for things that are bigger than our own capacity could ever produce. Boredom sets in because our sights are way too low. We need to raise them up and realize what God can do. Number three, mediocrity. Third sign of apathy, mediocrity. Just doing enough to get by. Hey, I'm not drinking like I used to drink. I'm not smoking pot. I'm not doing coke. I'm not sleeping around. I'm not as bad as everybody else. I haven't crossed the line. Just stop dancing around it, right? Run as far from the line as possible. Mediocrity, a sign of apathy that will develop into hypocrisy over time. Number four, disconnected. Disconnected. Disconnected from God, which usually happens out of shame, Feel like, oh, I blew it again. God's just tired and done with me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. When you blow it, God's like, that, that's why I sent my son. I sent my son so that when you blow it, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins. I write these things that you might not sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Disconnected. Disconnected from God disconnected from others. Maybe you're watching online right now. Maybe you're watching on TV and maybe this isn't even your church, but you've disconnected from the people of God. You've heard this line, I love God, I just don't like the church. I have a problem with that theologically, I really do. I mean, if somebody came up to me like, you know, pastor, I really love you. You're a great guy. I love hanging out with you. You inspire me. You encourage me. I want to be around you. The problem is this. I just can't stand your wife. Your wife is a hypocrite. Your wife is untrue. Your wife is not valuable. Your wife is, you know. I'd be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Don't tell me you love me and hate my wife because we are one. Right? Well, you can't tell God I love you but don't like your church because we are the bride of Christ. And when we attack one another, we are attacking the bride and we are attacking his bride and that's not something he takes lightly and neither would I. <laughs> Disconnected. Disconnected from the people of God. For many of you, who are watching online or on TV, it's time to get back into the house of God. And it doesn't have to be this house of God. Many of you are watching and you don't even go to this church. You don't even wanna to go to this church, but you have a church home and you need to get back 
into it. Be amongst the people of God because that's how God has designed for us. The, the, The enemy desires to isolate us so he can infiltrate us, right? Divide us so he can devour us. We are stronger when we're together. That's how God designed for the body of Christ to be. It's time to come back. It's time to come back. Hey, you can go to the grocery store. You can go to work. You can go to Home Depot. You can go to church. Enough is enough. It's time to come back. Familiarity, boredom, mediocrity, disconnected, and then passivity. Passivity is a really hard one to push through because the person that's passive, just, there's just nothing really important to that person. I just don't care. He said, well, th- this doesn't really please God. <laughs> Whatever, I don't care. I mean, the reality of it is extreme passivity would dis- to me would define the fact that the person's not even a believer. But passivity comes in. That, that, that idea, well, I can just take it or leave it. Eh, we'll go to church, we won't go to church. We'll fellowship with one another. We won't fellowship. I don't care. Restaurant, church, da ba ba. Passivity. It's this idea that we just, it's just not important enough. And see, here's the thing: if it's not important enough, then it's not important enough, and it needs to be. So, what do we do with that? What's the solution? Shame? No. Guilt? Of course not. That's never, God doesn't operate in the arena of guilt. More religion? Heck no. It didn't work for God's people in in Jeremiah's time. It's certainly not going to work for us in our time. The solution is relationship with Jesus. Going back. You see, I'm starting a new series today called Running with the Horses. And what the Holy Spirit has put on my heart to bring to the church is we need to spend some weeks talking about spiritual renewal. Rising higher in our walk with God. Learning how to lean upon the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, and to not get distracted from all the stuff that's in the world around us. It's time for the church to be the church. It's time for the church to get stirred up and and, and reformed in its truest sense. It's not time to run. It's a time to lead. It's a time to lead. In Revelation, Jesus is examining the churches, the churches that were present then, And then also the churches that are a type of the churches that will be present right up until the rapture of the church. I believe with all my heart that it could be at any moment. I think the signs that we talk about in the scriptures, everybody says, hey, pastor, are all the signs that we're seeing right now, are these the signs of the rapture? I say, no. They're the signs of the second coming. The good news is the rapture precedes the second coming. And so if we're seeing the signs of the second coming, the rapture could happen at any moment. But before it does, we want to make sure our hearts are ready, our priorities are right, and we're living for the one who's going to call his bride. And so Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the churches. And he said to the church at Ephesus, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear those who are evil, those who declare to be apostles, you found them out to be liars and they're not. I know how you're enduring enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you've not grown weary. I've been watching you do your thing for a long time and it's very noble, but I have one thing against you. You've left me your first love. In all of your doing, you forgot the one you're doing it for. And I think we can very easily do that, can't we? We can get so busy doing for God 
that we forget about the God that we're doing it for. And he gives him instruction. Remember, therefore, from when you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The three instructions that God gives the church at Ephesus then and the churches today and for each and every person that finds themselves in a place where their, their passionate love for Jesus has dwindled over time, the first thing that Jesus says to them is remember from whence you've fallen. Remember what it was. Remember what you've allowed to squeeze in between you and Jesus. Maybe it was a relationship. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it was a pursuit of something. Whatever, maybe it was some kind of sin. Whatever that might thing have, might have been, remember what it was that pulled you away. And then the second instructor is repent from that thing. Turn from that. Go the opposite direction. Repent of that thing. Repentance is not just being sorry, but it's acknowledging what was wrong and turning in a completely different direction and walking contrary to that action. Remember, repent, and then redo your first works. Remember those first works when you first came to Christ, when you first started to learn about God? You carve out time to be alone with Jesus and his word. That first love, friendship, love for God it was like, like a honeymoon experience. But then you got mature and you bumped into people who were imperfect and things got in the way and we get distracted. And when Jesus just says, man, just go Go back to those first works. Go back to those first works. And so, hard message, yes. But it's an invitation to come back to what God is looking to do in us and through us. And getting back to my illustration of the car wash, we shouldn't be focusing so much on all of the things that are rolling at us and bumping at us and knocking into us and squirting at us and coming up underneath us and dropping over us and being blown at us. That's not where our focus should be. Our focus needs to be on what's the purpose of the car wash. It's to wash the car. It's to come out clean. And you see, God will use whatever tools he chooses to use to bring us through the car wash of life. He that began a good work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And things might be blowing at you and bumping at you and rolling at you and squirting at you, but he's going to carry you through it. Hold tightly to Jesus. Because he's holding tightly onto you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the, in the invitation to relationship. Thank you for your faithfulness. Maybe you're listening this morning, whether present or online or some other time, and something that was said resonates with you. Maybe there's an area where you just allow to get in the way of your walk with God, and I just encourage you, ask God's forgiveness. Because he's faithful and just to forgive you, forgive you your sins. Today could be a new start, a fresh start, a fresh opportunity. What are we losing? Boredom? Things of this world? But away it says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for those who love him. And so, Lord, help us as a people. Holy Spirit, help us as Integrity Church. Lord, as we enter into what I believe is going to be a season of spiritual renewal, would you stir up the hearts of each and every one of us? God, would you do what we cannot do on our own? Lord, I recognize I can inform the minds 
with these words in the natural. But I pray, Holy Spirit, you will take these words and filter them through the supernatural that it might land in the hearts of each person to bring forth fruit. Lord, as we enter into the season, prepare us. Lord, we don't want yesterday's blessings. We don't want yesterday's stories. We're thankful for them. And someday we'll celebrate them. But Lord, we want new stories. We want to see new conversions. We want to see new people coming to Christ. We want to see you, Lord, do a work in us and through us that we've never seen before. Prepare our hearts. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.